Um, another suggestion made in uh, 1939 by Erwin Panofsky was in fact what you're looking at in Sacred and Profane Love, were the twin Venuses that Plato had talked about, which were revived during the Renaissance by Neoplatonic writers such as Ficino and Pico della Mirandola. Um, but in order for those to be the Neoplatonic Venuses, Panofsky made us do a very strange kind of flip-flop. Uh, he made us say that rather than reading it from left to right, and as the title goes, sacred and profane love, that profane love or earthly love was the one that was dressed and looked like she was on earth, and that sacred love was the one who was aspiring toward a more ideal love of God. Now, I don't think that we have to jump through those funny flip-floppy hoops because the idea of two Venuses, twin Venuses that Plato talked about, lived on throughout the entire Middle Ages and Renaissance. Uh, and in them, writers like Boccaccio describe quite clearly what the two Venuses looked like and what their attributes were. Uh, the nude Venus, which was the profane Venus, uh, was the one which probably is the most easily recognizable to us today. She was the one who was born of the sea and washed ashore on the island of Cyprus. Uh, and the place that she washed ashore, called Fals, was very, very famous throughout the entire Renaissance as the place that all the prostitutes were always on the beach, that all the sailors could go and dock and visit. Uh, he also mentions that she doesn't wear any clothes because for what she gets up to, she doesn't need it. Um, you might notice that in her hand, she holds a kind of, it isn't really flaming, it's sort of smoldering uh, bowl. Now, in antiquity, Venus didn't have a bowl like that. But in the Renaissance, she is very often shown, as we can see here in a print, which is clearly labeled Venus, um, a kind of flaming torch. And that torch really shows the inner passion of this lewd, carnal love that's associated with the nude Venus. Her twin, on the other hand, the heavenly um, or sacred Venus, uh, was the one who was associated most with springtime. Uh, when a young man's fancy might turn to love. And she appears quite frequently in depictions of the months. We're looking here at the uh, a fresco from the Villa Schifanoia in Ferrara, uh, in which you can see in the month of April, there you have Venus uh, being placed on a cart, pulled by swans, doves flying around her head and one of her lovers, Mars, uh, actually chained before her. Now, Boccaccio talks about this Venus and what her attributes are at great length. She had the scent of roses and myrtle surrounding her. You can see she wears red and white roses and that you have a big myrtle plant over there. Um, and you might notice that our Titian uh, she's wearing a myrtle crown that you can barely see in the slide, I'm sorry to say. She has roses in her hand. She has roses down here, rose petals here. Uh, and also, she has rabbits, you have to remember those. And uh, most importantly, she has a girdle. And her girdle has a name. Her girdle is called Cestus, because when she took it off, uh, for her various dalliances, she was incestuous. And you can see on her particular one, you have Cupid with his arrow aiming it directly at a pair of lovers. Now, many of those attributes that are given to this um, particular type of Venus uh, one can see in Titian's painting as well, as I pointed out, the myrtle and the flowers. Um, 
And it's also interesting that this kind of Venus, uh, the sacred uh, Venus, was actually associated with marriage, which is rather ironic because she was a really bad wife. Remember, she wasn't married to Mars, who was there in front of her. She was actually married um, to Vulcan, but she cheated on him quite a bit. And, but nevertheless, during the Renaissance, she was a sort of goddess of weddings and betrothals. And before a bride got married, uh, it was Venus who would come and make the wedding bed. It was Venus who would part her hair. It was Venus who would help her dress in her own image. And you find that theme running through classical uh, love poetry over and over and over again. You also um, might note that this particular uh, Venus was the Venus who was saw over the generative powers of love. In other words, a, the Venus of marriage was the Venus who oversaw the beginnings of the creation of a family. Now, there are several other items that this particular Venus wears which one might not associate, or which aren't associated by Boccaccio with Venus directly, but which certainly are associated with weddings. And one of those are gloves. Can you see she has both hands with these kinds of gloves on? And gloves were another thing that were often given as a present uh, by a groom to a bride. And we know from, a Petrarch wrote three sonnets about gloves. And he talks about how when his beloved's hands were inside gloves, he longed for the erotic pleasure of taking them off to see her beautiful hand. And Castiglione in The Courtier talks about the same thing, that a woman's hand within a glove um, made him have lascivious thoughts about what it was going to be like when the glove uh, came off. And in fact, just like the belt that her husband might give her, the gloves he might give her wouldn't come off until the marriage night. She, and here we, this is a painting by Pero Spodone. And in it, you can see, here's another, which must really be a bride. She has a glove there. Uh, she has a, her betrothed who is happily showing off the ring that he has probably given her. She has a belt, and she also has a patronosa, some uh, religious beads. And then, back there, there's another person. Now, you might wonder, you know, who is he? Why is he here? He actually, in Venice, is what was known as the Campagno dell'Anello, or the friend with the ring. He's a sort of ring bearer who is a witness to the vows that they're making when, they, when she takes the ring to be faithful and to pledge her troth. Over her hand, she has draped a uh, handkerchief. And a handkerchief, we know, uh, could take on several different kinds of meanings. You remember poor Desdemona, uh, when she dropped her handkerchief and it was picked up by the wrong person. And that was enough to make her husband believe that she had not been faithful. Um, we know from a uh, rather humorous uh, play that was written to be performed in 1523 at a Grimani marriage in Venice, um, they talk about the handkerchief and what the handkerchief could mean in marriage. And it has a, a various levels of meaning. Uh, if you saw it in church, it would show piety. Uh, if you saw it on the street, uh, as in Franco's picture of a Venetian matron right there, uh, it would show faithfulness to her husband. But if you saw it in bed, it could be very, very indecent because it was very helpful in the procreation of children. <laughs> 